Week six, international marketing. This is an area where there is an overlap between what we do in marketing and what we do in our international business faculty. So you'll note that the international marketing subject is under the International Business Code. And this is because what we have been doing for the last couple of years here at the RSM is getting international marketing to be part of the international business major. So that if you are interested in this as an area, you would do a marketing major and an international business major. But the key thing with global marketing from a marketer's perspective is that there are a number of strategic decisions embedded in the process and there are also a number of very familiar techniques because it is after all marketing it's just that you are looking for larger distribution challenges and a few other bonus features there's a couple of notes to the process these are things that are very of my experience of teaching marketing over time one of the most important things from an international marketer's perspective and from a marketer's perspective, nations are not market segments. And you'll hear this, you'll say, oh, we're going to sell to China. That, that's, what does that mean? That's not a meaningful phrase. You don't sell to Australia. You don't even sell to Canberra. Market segmentation starting with the geography, moving into the geodemographic dynamics, you can say, we're going to export to the nation of, and then start talking about the target market located within that nation. But if you are not coming into your international marketing with segmentation, positioning, targeting, you're not doing marketing, but you're also missing the opportunities. And we're going to talk about a couple of distinct market segments that emerge through global marketing, through international marketing, and why those are valuable in their own right. But if you're not thinking segment, target, position, you're going to miss the opportunity here. The second thing you should understand about international marketing is, courtesy of the internet, we are automatically in the global marketing environment the moment we put something up on the internet and put it up for sale. So any product that is on the internet, any service that is provided on the internet, or any physical good brokered through an internet-based brokerage like eBay, Etsy, these automatically turn us into always global. Now how you can tell the difference by global between global by choice and always global. When you're talking global by choice, it's intentional. So we go back to the idea of market, marketing with intentionality, conscious marketing. You can be intentional about wanting to share something from your home country to the world. You've created something here in Australia, you want the world to share it. Or somewhere in Europe, you've got access to something exclusive, you want that, it only works for your region, it only grows in your region, or it only gets built in your region, and you want the world to have access to it. That can be intentional. Or you're in it for the money, you want to expand the market, and you want to sell more things to more people, and you've run out of options in your home ground, you're looking internationally for more money. It's all about deliberate decision making. And a couple of the tells of deliberate decision making is destination currency pricing. Distribution costs are embedded within the price. And there are multiple different distribution channels. You have at least looked at the legal implications of the destinations that you are targeting and that you are trying to reach. And you perhaps have even set up last mile provision, that there is a clearing house in your destination nation so that you can ship in bulk and have it broken down and redistributed to individual packages within the country. Now how you can often tell unintentional is 
it's PayPal for the transaction, quotes are on a per shipping basis, everything's paid in the home currency of the provider, buyer assumes all responsibility for everything, including insurance, legality, fees at the ports, everything, extra taxes, import duties. And to me, probably the biggest one is there's only one shipping option, and that shipping option is more expensive than the product itself, which has also been the curse of trying to buy things on the internet since 1996. The idea that, again, with a strategic decision, an intentional global strategy, you would look at how do I ensure that my total price concept, the total value of my offer, and the total cost of my offer match up, knowing that I'm going to need to shove something into a bag and have it spend four months traveling across the ocean. So a couple of the key ideas. Country of origin effect. This is part branding, part psychological influence, and part the fact that humans are really a bit stupid when it comes to national stereotypes. So the idea here is that the country of origin effect is the set of assumptions and influences that come from a consumer perceiving the value offer from a particular nation or particular region. For example, France and the assumptions that are made around France in terms of, say, perhaps quality or luxury, Switzerland, I'm going to pick on the Europeans for a few minutes, Germany for precision, despite the fact the Swiss do watches, uh, the British for, um, well, yeah, never mind. But there's this assumption, these are assumptions. You also get regional assumptions, so part of this ties into regional branding. The idea that champagne can only be legitimately labelled champagne if it comes from the Champagne region of France also ties into things like the regional branding of Australia, the regional branding of regions within a nation, so the idea of the Adelaide, uh, Barossa Valley for the wine, versus, say, Belconnen for the wine, there are certain stereotypical factors that you can build on, you can use, and that people tend to default to. Now, of course, what you can do is you can completely play with this by going and branding your product to mimic a country of origin effect. Fisher & Paykel, the New Zealand-based brand that tried to convince everyone they were from Europe because European brands had a stronger reputation in the white goods area. Actually, that was one thing the British did really well for a while there, washing machines. They didn't do dry as well, and you'd think with their climate. The second caveat about international marketing is, oh boy, the opportunity to indulge in commercialized racism is huge. And we go back to conscious marketing and conscientious marketing. Even if we look at the mate song campaign that kicked off just before Australia burnt down, it was cliche. I mean, I've got the screen cap of Kylie Minogue in a tree with a koala with Sydney Harbour Bridge behind it. The only thing that's missing here is the land down under being played gently in the background. Using stereotypes of the target nation, but also exporting stereotypes. Tapping into the racist vibe of a target nation to sell them racism at wholesale and retail prices. Playing up to market assumptions. Using cliches and assumptions around costuming and outfits and clothing to sell export to export products into a market using the cliches countries are not goddamn theme parks you're not all walking around the place in the same uniform we are needing to move on with beyond this as marketers 
Also, the problem we have here is that as soon as you start really heavily playing to your country of origin effect, functionally you are using commercialized racism. You're using stereotypes and cliches. You have to think about that from your sustainability, your ethics, and your intentionality. Is this something that you are comfortable perpetuating a stereotype for f personal financial gain ahead of breaking out of this and treating people as individuals, complex, nuanced individuals. Your final caveat on this is why I say you don't sell to nations and you sell to segments within nations is stereotypes in your market segmentation will kill your product and your company and you'll deserve it. If you use a bunch of cliches rather than using real data, you will run with racist assumptions created by someone who probably didn't have that country's best interests in mind or whatever colonial power first invaded them, hi Britain, and it won't work for you. It will be to your detriment. If you start looking at these target locations, the international marketing locations, and saying, well, tell me more about the customers who are there. Break it down into the same way, show the same respect and nuance you would for a domestic segmentation targeting positioning strategy. Do the same for an international strategy. Find out that actually it's commercially viable to be good at what you do. Use nuance. So. The other thing we need to point out is globalization versus nationalization. A big trend for the past, well, I've been teaching marketing for over 20 years. A major trend in marketing, particularly exacerbated by the internet, was the idea that we would start having these global frictionless marketplaces that big trading blocks and you know, the idea that we'd all turn into one big global planet of economy and trading and everything else. <sighs> and welcome to the 2020s in which protectionism, nationalism and counter reverse globalism is on. England leaves the European Trading Union, America tries to burn any surplus capital it has, and Australia just tries to burn down. Globalization is a pendulum. We'd swung it about as hard as we could. We're tracking back towards the middle. Whether it swings back into isolation and regionalization. Also, it's possible that isolation and regionalization may be a facet of what we need to do in terms of sustainability. It may be that it's financially the best possible practice to build something mine the plastic air out of the resource mines, out of the oil wells of the Middle East, turn it into a bottle somewhere in Russia, send that bottle around to Canada to be labelled, send the label down to Fiji to be filled with water, and send that bottle back to London to be sold. It might be that it's super cheap to do all that, it's just not environmentally sustainable. In fact, we should stop ripping off water from Fiji in the first place. But the globalization is, is a trend that's trending back towards nationalization, regionalization, and isolationism. Similarly, the internet is global market space. It's not, it's not its own entity. In fact, we've been much more nationalized and we've gotten much stronger national boundaries on the internet now than we have ever had. So, Again, we're seeing adverts for VPNs, virtual private networks, to get around national-based filtration systems. The British have a national filter list. The Australians have a national filter list. There was an idea that the internet would create this market space that would facilitate the global economy. It also gave rise to the idea of the born global company, which had a head office somewhere, and quite often that somewhere was Ireland because they had the best tax deals. It's headquartered somewhere, it avoids paying tax there and everywhere else. But for a born global entity, there is an awful lot of concentration inside the United States when we start going PayPal. PayPal is a global financial transaction scheme headquartered in America, bound by US banking rules, subjected to the vagaries and whims of the US morality police, which is why 
a number of legal products legal in other nations that are not morally acceptable inside America can't use PayPal because it's an American service. Same for the Amazon server banks, the headquarters, wherever it's headquartered. The servers are residing inside the United States. They're physically located inside a geographic region. Therefore, they're bound to the laws of the geographic location. Same again for things like the Americans have a whole bunch of embargoes on what you can trade and ship. That actually influences the data you can host and the data you can move. And if you're using rebrokerages like eBay, like Etsy, you can't ship to certain locations and you can't sell to certain locations because you can't accept payments from those places. So when the Americans say they're going to put an embargo on Iran, try not to use PayPal to get paid by someone who's buying your stuff off Etsy from Tehran. The last point is that at the moment there is a massive trend in the PESTEL, again the PESTEL environment, the political environment, there's a big push to have borders on the internet and governments wanting borders even if people inside those nations don't particularly fancy the borders. Last aspect in terms of the challenge of globalism that's really important to come to terms with, Australia is really far away from everywhere else. And we're talking time zones. We're talking that 10 a.m. in Canberra is 1 a.m. in the UK. We're also talking about the fact that if you are looking here, the hard limit of physics, the flight, the best flight you can get, and I say best in terms of a direct flight from Australia to England, requires you to leave from Perth. Perth to London is 17 to 19 hours, weather permitting. It's four hours from this side. From Canberra to Perth is four hours. Australia is big and far away. So when we start looking at things like the hard limits of physics, we're talking about things like digital technology. If you are trying to ping a server in London, it is physically hitting up against the hard limits of physics for how fast light travels for a signal to get there and back again. So there are challenges of globalization on the fact that it's a really big planet. And Australia, tiny little market, smaller than many, the whole country population is smaller than a whole lot of cities in other nations, and we're geographically diverse and spread all over the place. The pro side is because we're so big and geographically split up, there's a lot of opportunities to test drive things in Australia because we're nice little pocket markets that reflect other parts of the world. We have a ridiculous number of uh, mirror climate conditions in Australia that mirror dozens of other countries. But the challenge of globalization for us as Australians doing export is everywhere is far. It is a good day's commitment to go to a time zone on the other side of the country, on the other side, on the other side of the planet. And as someone who does this on a reasonably regular basis, there's also the sheer physicality of you need to allocate, if you're going to spend a weekend in London, that's a day to fly over, two days up, and three days downtime coming home because you're going to cross the international dateline. It's a, it's a tough thing. So there's a lot of the sheer distribution, physicalities, limits of physics, tyranny of distance stuff that you need to factor into global marketing. The other reason why we teach the international marketing in the third year is there are so many crossover elements. You need to have some grasp of marketing strategy. The external environments, the pestle analysis is really critical. The marketing mix is important. CB counts for a lot. Business to business is one of the fundamental principles of global marketing and it's taught much more in that context because importing and exporting and alliances with firms overseas to be your brokers, it's a whole lot of stuff. So we're going to give you a summary, a, a quick short sharp summary of what the global looks like. Um, one of the things I want to talk to 
here as well is in the pestle analysis, there are some bugs to avoid. And I want to start by talking about political government. A dominant national ideology does not necessarily mean every region of the country is homogenous. If you were to describe Australia in some of the ways that we describe other nations, the period between John Howard to Scott Morrison would be described as a rural economy, a regional rural economy island with an unstable political leadership and a high level of turnover of political figures. So be cautious about investing in this region because the government seems unstable. When, in fact, if you look at the period in time, yes, we churned a whole lot of politicians, but it didn't seem to make much of a difference. Section 44 strikes again. Stability, frequency of elections or absence of elections or regime changes, leadership changes. These are facets that, depending on how you describe a nation, you can describe it as it is a stable government of consistency or it's a government that hasn't faced an election in 30 years. There's also things to consider around the political processes, how many there are, what types of governments are involved, how many, how many different political parties there are. In America, there seems to be two political parties at the federal level, the Democrats and the Republicans, and there seems to be 10,000 things going on at the state level because they elect they elect everything. I swear they elect librarians. So if you look at the political, you also need to look at the macro, micro, and meso scales of where political takes place. So it's a lot more nuanced than just going, oh, America, capitalist. We can sell to them. Well, they're a trade protectionist, um, inward looking, uh, self isolating nation that believes it's morally superior to everyone else. We could sell them lots of stuff, to be honest. They'd be completely into uh, importing things with American flags on it. Particularly if you make it sound like it's from somewhere, you know, the great southern land, you know, Texas. So the second area after politics is economics. Again, one of the things you're looking at here is the stability of the economy, the frequency, the preferences for currency. Do they deal in American dollars, domestic currency? exchange rates, how strong is our dollar to their dollar, to their currency, what is their currency called, how many units their currency operate in, and is it like, again, I'm going to pick on the Americans, can you tell their currency apart at first glance? Or, picking on the Australians, do that, can you differentiate their currency from toy money? Ours is shiny plastic and made with colours. It's cool. Phase two of the pestle, analysis. Things you want to think about. The society, the cultural dimensions, and we'll talk about the Hofstede, the dominant ethical systems that are present inside a region, inside a, and again, this is why you've got to think about regions and sub-markets. On the surface, if you look at society of Australia, there is a cliche that we're an egalitarian, um, casteless society. If you look at Australia and you realise the number of third generation politicians, the number of seats that have been held by grandfather, father, son, grandfather, father, daughter, you realise that actually there is a strong social strata and there are ruling classes and the Murdoch family has been around for a long time and before them there were not just before them, but alongside them, Kerry Packer Sr., Kerry Packer Jr. Now, thankfully, James Packer got, went, I'm rich and I don't care. But we have very clear social caste structures. We have very clear social stratas. And if you don't think that's true, think about the different suburbs and the assumptions you make when you hear about different suburbs. If suburbs have got stratas and cliches and stereotypes attached to them, we have social strata. 
But that's the whole thing. Social strata is just, it's a functional element of society. And it also underpins things like attention to social comparison information. It underpins the innovation adoption curve. You can't have opinion leaders unless you have opinion followers. And leaders, therefore, create followerships, which create castes and stratas. You have someone who, by birth, by genetic lottery of birth, finds themselves in a leadership position because of who their grandparents were, and they're seen as a person of influence and raised to be a person of influence. A big hello to all of the uh, generation celebrity children whose parents did something who, because their parents were famous, the kids automatically became famous, and now the children of the children are famous for being famous. As opposed to, say, the Hilton family, which is famous for being the owners of a hotel chain. But then, strata, society. The other things you want to look at in a country, you want to look at technology, the theocracy versus technocracy. Where are they on the spectrum between belief in reality and belief that reality bends to the will of the rulers. Australia is really high on the theocracy. Reality is subjective. Do they invest in science? Does the nation, is there a national trend towards investments in science, broadband, university funding? Australia's not so great on those fronts. Uh, well, if a church asks for money and a university asks for money, who's more likely to get it? But also, how's the nation in terms of picking up innovations? What's their sort of level? What's the ambient resistance to change? To what extent does a society openly profess support for science versus open rejection of science? These are questions you need to be assessing, but you also want to assess your own home country against it whilst before you start judging someone else's. And you also want to be using these as segmentation tools and ways to go, is there a product is there a value offer that can leverage off this? Am I prepared to offer that value offer? Now briefly talking about the Hofstede cultural dimensions. Hofstede Senior passed away recent in 2020, so it's a little, there's a second generation looking after, speaking of, well actually, speaking of social mobility, stratus cast and ruling classes, there are two generations of Hofsteds who have been working the same theoretical domain. It's a thing, it's just a factor, it's a thing that happens. Now the key things in the cultural dimensions is to look at these factors and think this is about, as this is a segmentation technology. So something like uncertainty avoidance. A wish to have fixed habits, I wish to know the truth, I distrust in the face of the unknown. These are things that will inform the society, inform the culture, which then informs the way in which your product is compatible with someone's lifestyle, with their belief, with how you can engage that audience. Now, this is worth reading up and I draw your attention to them because a couple I want to just uh, highlight is long-term versus short-term. Long-term says we must prepare for the future because it's unstable. Short-term says it is today as it was yesterday, therefore the past is a good compass for the future. Conservatism, progressivism, there's different elements here. But the key one for me as a marketer to be aware of is the trap around individualism. The idea of a society which is individualistic versus a society which is collectivist, there are individualistic streaks and collectivist streaks within those societies. On aggregate, they might fit in a particular framework, but you're not selling to the aggregate, you're selling to a specific target market. So what you are interested in is understanding, does your target market prioritize the individual choice or does it prioritize the collective choice? If the target market prioritizes the collective choice, 
there is bigger opportunity to bring the whole audience on board at once. If they prioritize individual choice, your challenge is when you get to a critical mass of individuals who are doing the same thing, they're going to start rejecting your offer because other people are doing it. So the individualism is not a universally, oh, people will buy my thing because they're individuals. People will reject my product offer because too many other people have accepted it. It's like anyone who's ever stopped listening to their previously favorite band because they became popular. And collectivism means that an all, one in, all in approach, it's a bigger market. It's a more effective market. So perhaps you want to be targeting the collectivists more than the individualists. These are things, this is again, a decision making. You want to come back to conscious marketing, intentional choice, but also starting to think, when you look at things like the notion of individualism, and you look at the impact society experiences from marketing messages. If we prioritize our marketing message, the collectivism ideal of all in alignment, all in together, buy our product to be part of the pack, a collectivist message. To start with, the individualists get a really easy thing. They just have to reject that product and they're an instant rebellion. But if we're pushing collectivism at a marketing level because we want to sell a lot of things to a lot of people at the same time, and the Xbox went a long way down that path to do that, and so does Marvel, and so do a lot of movies which go, don't miss out on seeing this season. The concept of missing out only works if you're interested in knowing your place and being part of a pack. If you go down this path, what is the social impact you are bringing? In social marketing, we've often thought about the unintended consequences of focusing on individual choice and individualism and creating cultural shifts where ownership of the self, ownership of your own life and your own destiny through health choices, through consumption of uh, personal products, but we equally can do it through the influence that our messages send towards individualism or towards collectivism because we're trying to position our product as inside the culture or outside the culture. So there's a lot of this that you need to be thinking about from that ethics and morality point of view. Down into the next part of the PESTLE framework. Oh la la, legal. There are a number of things to say about legality and all of them start with get a local lawyer. To what extent is the market similar to yours? What regulations are in place? Every legal system is unusual to an outsider. Use local knowledge. What layers of legality exist? Federal? Or is it federal or national? Is it state or regional? Is it local or municipal? And if you break down Australia under this category for a moment, Australia has a number of states. Within those states, there are a number of city council regions. If you take Queensland as your priority state, you have the Mount Isa City Council, which is the largest geographic area, and you have Brisbane City Council, which is the largest city council in existence. You take a map of those two city councils and their territories and lay that onto Sydney and you've got more city councils than you know what to do with. Sydney, every few streets, it's a new council. Because of Sydney's origins, its backstory, there's a lot. If you were to treat, however, you would treat Australia as a homogenous unit, and this is why you've got to be careful using the local example here, Canberra is a territory. Canberra's territory government. Go up to Queensland, it's a state. It has a state government, it has a whole bunch of local governments. It doesn't have an upper house. So it's only got one, uh, one line of states. Come down across the border, go into New South Wales, you have an upper house and a lower house and way too many local governments on average. 
So there's a whole bunch of things that if you were to snapshot Queensland, you'd completely misunderstand New South Wales. If you were to snapshot Sydney, you would completely misunderstand the rest of Australia. So you've again got to be on your geography, got to be on your segmentation, you've got to be on your target market. Where inside this nation do I focus? What do I need to know about operating there? Environment, a lot of things around the geography. Um, again, I points. In Australia, we have more truck manufacturers, different brands, different types of truck manufacturers in Australia than any other nation on the planet because we have all of the geographies that they are going to ever need to deal with available in the one country. You can take a truck and drive it around Australia and get snow, desert, flood terrains, jungle, fire. I think about the only thing, actually no, there is nothing we don't offer here. Uh, we don't get down to the Canadian level of cold, but that's pretty much, we can get uh, 10 degrees below if you find the right place. But you also then have to start thinking in terms of when you're looking at an international marketing case, what's the physical access to this location? To getting to Australia, there's a huge amount of water around the outside of Australia. Getting within Australia, there's a lot of territory. Japan, similarly, completely surrounded by water. Slightly smaller to operate in. You then have to start thinking about, well, what's the road, rail, vehicle access? What's the freight access? Who's the neighbors? Landlocked versus sea locked? A whole lot of considerations around your distribution and supply chain. And recently, we had to start thinking of disaster risk. Is it on fire? Is it on flood? Does it have earthquakes? Is it prone to droughts? Is there a fire tornado? Are there infectious diseases we have to worry about? Are there geo boundaries we have to deal with in terms of certain times of the year? The area is inaccessible. Let's see the whole of North Australia. So these are factors that all need to be brought into the analysis of is it this market that I want to target worth engaging in because I'm going to go into unfamiliar territory because it's outside of my home nation. Let's talk a little bit about international marketing decision making. A couple of decisions you need to make. Number one, you are going to do a market segment. That's it. But you've got a couple of options. You've got a couple of preset options. First thing, migrants. If you are from England, living in somewhere that's not England, your, the English stuff you had back in your home country is an exotic export. So people from, and Australians are really prone to this, you get, you're somewhere based internationally and the Tim Tam craving hits and you're willing to pay $15 a packet just to get that hit of Tim Tams. But the immigrant market, people from the country of origin wanting country, items from the country of origin. There's a lot of markets to be made from that. Most supermarkets have a dedicated section that is international. And one of the most amazing things is when you're walking around another country to see what gets exported. Walking through Hong Kong, looking at the Australian products going, I don't recognize these brands. Being in Canada, seeing the Australian cuisine. I'm like, okay, that's unfamiliar stuff. Although in fairness, the kangaroo was legit. So functionally, immigrant markets. Also, the word expatriate doesn't have any value. Skip. We don't use expat as a word. So you've got two target markets. You've got the market uh, that is the domestic market in the country you're going to. So to them, you are trying to create an offering that has value. Um, does it solve a problem better? Or does, there, does this market gain a value from the fact that your product is international? Is there a prestige attached to it? Is there a country of origin effect? Is there an exclusivity because it's rare and from somewhere else? So kind of automatically there are three markets with a distinct value offer proposition that you can segment on. 
The next up is there's some strategic decisions. And this one, so I want to basically uh, break it down because I want to talk about a couple of the crossover points. If you're going to export, then you make it locally. It's made in a, your domestic market and it's sent overseas. So there's a lot of business to business. There's a lot of distribution. There's total price concept and there's a range of challenges involved in the export. But that really works well for fiscal goods. Franchising works well for intellectual property goods, for services, for where you can design it locally, get good at it locally, run local versions, then license international applications. McDonald's, KFC, Subway, these are franchises. They are export franchises because it's an idea that was picked up, created elsewhere, brought into another nation, licensed out to a local provider to run it with royalties going back home and instructions coming from home base to the franchise. There are things such as the strategic alliance approach, which is basically design where you've got the best design, get your product created where it can best be created, and then cross over. So this is where you see portions of percentage of this product made locally. And I believe on the uh, back of the old Coles package here, it's got the Australian. Uh, next time you're in Coles, grab yourself a uh, the jar of the peanut butter. On the back, you'll see a little barcode right beside the Australian logo, Australian made logo that says the percentage of this that was made locally. Sometimes it's the brand. A strategic alliance is to use the local brand to strengthen an international product. Sometimes it's manufactured and produced locally, but using a global brand. Go with the strengths. But that also is going to require a bit of understanding of market research, of market needs. Uh, and it's going to be a case of that and the joint venture are very similar. But the one that I'm going to say, I'm just going to call this here, is I don't think direct investment counts as local, as uh, international marketing, as a, a, an export theory here. Um, if you're buying a local firm, whoopty, you're a local provider, you just bought a local firm. The money might go somewhere else, but if you're running a local firm owned by locals, you don't even really count. All right, final thing to talk about is the localization, globalization, globalization, the interaction effects. So I want to highlight two elements here. I want to talk to the reason why we think about these things. So this is the final chapter of the sequence of the, the first half of the semester. And here is a set of ideas of hooking back what is the, if you're going to go into global marketing or international marketing, what can you leverage? So product, is the point of origin a value? Is the fact that it's internationally sourced a benefit? Can you use country of origin effect? Is there something unique about your country that creates a country of origin effect? Can you use a premium pricing strategy? Now, we haven't talked about some of these strategies yet because we haven't gone into depth on the marketing mix. But this is laying down some ideas that can recur later when we get into these sections. You can come back and revisit. The total price concept. The product plus the export charges, plus the distribution delivery charges, plus all the currency conversions. Does it turn a at destination, at location, cheap product into a luxury good. Before Starbucks opened up their franchise here, importing a bag of Starbucks coffee made Starbucks a premium product. If you wanted to have a cup of Starbucks, you were paying $70 or $80 a kilo for their coffee beans. Roll out today, I don't think you got the same demand. Does the exclusivity of an exported product into a region give it something special in terms of what it can be priced? Can you use the same message that you use in your domestic market, in your international market, or 
does the positioning of it by its price, its rarity, its exclusivity, mean that you can use a new message for this new market? Can you reposition your product? Um, these are the other aspect here is the movement from country of origin to destination. Is this a feature? Is it something to make a the distribution gain some form of value? Coming down to the franchise, the idea of the cultural fit. Are you using a cultural framework to support your franchise? Now, in America, there are a number of Australian coffee shops that sell coffee done, brewed, Australian style. There are a number of pizzerias, New York pizzerias around the world, that import the water from New York so they have the right texture to their pizza so it tastes like a New York pizza. There are other places that don't know that there's a difference and don't do that. Also, water changes by texture wherever you are in the geographic region. So yes, there are different types of water. In terms of the franchise uh, as well though, in your home ground, what is your positioning strategy? Where does your price put your franchise in context to other competitive offerings? And I'm gonna highlight the Nando's food chain for a second here of, in the UK, going to a British Nando's restaurant is a, there's a maitre d greets you at the door, there's a wait for tables and you've recommended to book. Going to a Nando's in Australia, you first find your Nando's, but you walk in and go up to the counter and you order from the front counter. The two occupy different um, locations in the food vending market space. The cultural aspects and cultural artifacts, can you leverage, can you create destination like little pocket versions of the home, home ground nation inside your franchise? And can you bring the whole thing together? Does it make sense to offer a pocket version of another nation inside your franchise, or do you want your franchise to try and slot into its domestic market and you're just using some of the ideas? So an Australian coffee shop in America could trick itself out with Australiana and have the most uh, nasal toned, yeah, g'day mate, gang, uh, type of baristas, or it could slot itself in with a perfect set of New York accents and just sell Australian style brewing. The flat white, apparently it's a big thing. It's, I don't know. So you need to, th you need to do this as a holistic, strategic, and this is why we put the subject into third year, is you need to be thinking the strategy. Because the final point I want to draw your attention to in the recap is that fundamentally, international marketing is the ANSOF matrix. You either have a product you already make and you're looking for a new market in that global marketplace, or you have a market that you address in that global marketplace and you're wanting to import something new to deal with them, or you've eyed off somewhere and gone, hmm, new market, let's build something new for the international clientele. You can, once you've established yourself, you can be in the um, existing market, existing product, but most expansions into an international market, most international starting to do your international marketing, you are taking a product that you have and you are looking for a market that you can access. So you're in one of the squares in the Ansoft matrix and it's often a growth strategy, but it could be a defensive strategy. It may be that you are looking for a market that you have excess product, that you are exiting a market in your home country and you're now looking to use up what's left of the stock in an international because you can reposition it in the international market as a prestige, as a premium, as a luxury. So your limited range of surviving stock can be sold off at a much higher price to a new market who gets value from it because it's scarce, it's rare, and it's international. So these are 
Global marketing is a challenging area. There's a lot of decisions. There's a lot of strategy. But it boils down to you need to use the fundamentals of the discipline. You need to know who is it I'm targeting, how, what's my market segment, what's my target, and how am I positioned in that market as the outsider coming into this market space, how do I leverage that position to create something of value for my target audience and for myself?